Hopefully this will be better. Go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Montana Baptist Church, this beautiful Lord's Day. This is Sunday, October the 17th. The month of October is now beyond midpoint. And there's a lot of things that are beginning to unfold in the life of our church. As we look at today's announcements and the things that are happening <laughs> and up and coming. On October the 24th is the date, as a matter of fact, that will be next Sunday. The newsletter items for this November and December are up and coming. The 25th at 6.30, we have a leadership board meeting. And then Thursday, November the 4th, uh, the, the sandwiches that are being sold, the ham and cheese, will be delivered here. Uh, and here's a ongoing mission, the project that we have been doing for several years. Between November the 7th and November the 14th will be the Harvest Mission Outreach. Uh, we're collecting uh, non-perishable food items. Uh, please contact a deacon. Of any, uh, if you have any suggestions or if you need to uh, uh, know of a family that is in need of the, of the uh, bounty that each and every year this church just pours out their hearts and gives to those who are in need. So, I encourage you to bring those items in, and then we'll make sure that they get to the, those folks who are in need and need it the most. The ongoing uh, WISE cards are still available. You see uh, Yvonne and Mary Sue or Mary Funk. Uh, Operation Christmas Child will be going out in about three weeks. So, uh, from what we've been informed, that they have already a hundred boxes ready to go out. Uh, the uh, postage has been covered at $9 per box, but if they get more uh, cash donations or donations <coughs> for this, they'll be able to make a few more boxes to go. So uh, if you wish to donate to that, uh, see Jamie, she'll be able to tell you uh, which direction to go with that. Also, this week I received a, a, a magazine that uh, for you know, American Family Association. And on the inside, there was a, a, a pamphlet uh, that just struck my heart. And I think it's something that uh, you know, we as can possibly become involved in. It's individually up to you. It's called the uh, Orange Letter Campaign. And uh, the Orange Letter Campaign is your opportunity to reach out to Christians all around the world in a tangible way. Many of these Christians are missionaries in cultures that persecute them for their faith and are facing trials which Christians in the United States have never experienced. We're asking you to write a short letter, short letter of encouragement and prayer that are full of scripture. Remind these Christians that they are not alone in their trials and that the church around the world is lifting them up in prayer. And of course, it uh, gives the address. It says, write your letter. Now, this is to be sent out via the computer. Uh, and Mary Funk has already made it volunteered that if you're not computer friendly and you wish to send a, a short letter of encouragement, the uh, she will do that for you. And if you do that, you'll also receive a, uh, a t shirt. That, that you can wear in solidarity for the Christians around the world who are suffering for the sake of the gospel. The pamphlet looks like this. It's out on the bulletin board along with the email address where you would send the letter. And Mary is more than willing to help you in that endeavor to send it out to them. And don't forget, you might want to know what t-shirt size you wear. So with that, uh, do we have any other announcements? If not, Anna, she has a, a reading for this morning. This was about 
same dealing uh, reading about animals for October 15th. The Prince of Wrath is the title of it, and it comes from James 1 20. Human anger does not produce the righteous God desires, righteousness that God desires. Our friend Lee presented us with a Siamese fighting fish as an apartment woman present. We weren't allowed to have furry pets, so Lee felt Attila would be just the creature to keep us company. The fish was amazingly beautiful with its burgundy and magenta tail and fins. However, like most male betas, he was feisty. He didn't like people peering at him too closely. Whenever Attila felt threatened or disturbed, he would flare his fins. He often attacked his reflection, butting his face against the glass and flaring. We didn't dare put another fish in the tank with him. Attila was much too hot-headed. One day he injured himself and developed a skin ulcer and died. Anger killed, my husband reminded me. I nodded. We knew an angry couple that suffered from high blood pressure, stomach ulcers, and strokes. These folks bristled with hostility and were too easily offended. Everyone provoked their wrath. The Apostle Paul warned the Ephesians not to let the sun set on their anger. That's good advice. I've tried to remember it over the years. It's dangerously easy to let anger smolder until one day it bursts into flames. I don't want to lash out at others or repay or insult with a stinging retort of my own. I don't want to nurse grudges or plot payback. I don't want my temper to flare like poor Attila's. Thankfully, God can and will bless us with peace and patience if we ask him to do so. And then, this is a quote from Mark Twain. Anger is an asset that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. And I just thought as I read this, as we put our anger back aside, out of our minds, we need to remember to keep giving to our love gift boxes each and every day. Because God is so good to us in everything that we have. We have so much to be thankful for. He's an awesome God. He is. Uh, thank you, Adam. We'll continue our worship service this morning with the responsive reading of number 418. It's Psalms 121. Uh, stand if you are able. I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where is the help to come from? Help comes to me from Jehovah who made the heavens and the earth. Then letting our footsteps slip, for this Lord our be yours, he does not let us. The guardian of Israel does not let us go to sleep. Jehovah guards you, shades you. With Jehovah at your right hand, sun cannot strike you down by day, nor moon at night. Jehovah guards our arm, he guards our lives. He is always with us, regardless of where we're at, from the deepest pit to the highest mountain. Join us now as we read, sing, excuse me, number 397, Fill My Cup.
Father, we come to you in the name that is above all names, our Lord and our Savior and our soon coming King Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, until that time that we see you face to face, we would ask that each and every heart would come to you, Lord, that we would fill up, be overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Lord, sometimes we get dry, and Lord, we need to come to the well to be refreshed. And sometimes we get we go on a starvation diet. Feed us, Lord, with your word. Feed us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, what a wonderful and thing that it is that we can come to you knowing that you're there for each and every problem or situation of life. Lord, that we can flow, your spirit can flow out of us and be an attractant to those around. When folks will ask, what is it that makes you so different? We can declare to them that you have filled us up and we know the answer to all the situations of life. Fill us, Lord. From out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water, your word declares. Lord, we thank you. Fill each heart that is here this morning that we can spill over from beyond these walls to our homes, our jobs, wherever it is you place us, and may you be able to share the love and the light of the salvation message of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Are you happy and you know it? All righty. <laughs> can go over there. Scripture is from 2 Corinthians 4, Four. 7 to 12. Pull the mic up. You can't hear me? Can you hear now me we now? can now. <laughs> but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this is all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, 
we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in us, in you. May the Lord add his blessing. Amen. Thank you, Joy. Our next song is uh, number 401, Higher Ground.
And that's where we're going this morning. The title of this morning's message is Paul's Pep Talk. He wrote a letter to the church of Corinth. And of Corinth, by your Bible studies and things of that nature, you know it was a very jaded community. It was a main intersection for travel and trade there in Asia. And Corinth was such influenced by many different cultures and different belief systems and all sorts of debauchery and all kinds of things because of, of where they were. You know, and the influences that they had. But yet, in, in this debased community, Paul planted a church. And of course, as you see, the, the, the church began to grow. And as churches do begin to grow and things of that nature, sometimes folks become a little bit discouraged as to what's not happening fast enough. And they begin to, you know, think, well, is it really worth all this effort and things of that nature? But here, Paul is giving a, a, a pep talk. Have any of you ever been to a place where, where they've given you a motivational speech and what it does is it fires you up so that you can go out and do whatever it is, whether it be job related or if it be ministry related or whichever, you know, uh, I've heard stories of the, of the, uh, the tales of the individuals and when the team goes back in it at, at uh, halftime and the coach has to fire them back up or else <laughs> ring them out, whichever, I don't know. I've never been in the locker room to, to hear, but I've heard some stories, you know, especially if you've made a dumb play and the other team's ahead by them. But, anyway. but making, get, to, get them geared up for the second half. Get them geared up because the end of the game is coming. You know, here this letter, this epistle that Paul has written to the church at Corinth is, is words of encouragement. It lets them know that they're not alone in where they stand, that others have faced the very same situations that they have faced. And Paul is reminding them of where their faith lies. And who is in charge? And from where does the power come that they are allowed, they are continue to do the work of ministry? The, the passage of scripture that Joy read this morning starts in verse 7 of the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. But to get the full effect of what's taking place, we're going to back up just a little bit. I'm going to read to you the fourth chapter the first six verses of chapter four. You know, there's nothing more powerful than the spoken word of God. Not my voice, but what God speaks through his word. The apostle Paul writes this in chapter four, verse one. Therefore, and whenever we see that which is written there, whenever we see the word there, we need to pay attention. Because the things that were just explained to you is now coming into play. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we received mercy, we faint not. You see, the church there at Corinth had a ministry. The church here in Montana has a ministry. Churches throughout the world have ministries. And that is to reach out to those debased individuals that want to reject God. But have renounced the, the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them who are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Well, isn't there a lot of that going around? Satan has blinded and deceived the individuals. When they hear the gospel, they don't believe it. But it's our job, as he says here, you know, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, would shine onto them. We're to shine, they were, Paul was telling, we're to shine the image of the living Savior onto these individuals. Tell them 
the truth. For we preach not ourselves. We don't preach anything about Ron Wagner here. I wouldn't have anything to preach about it. And maybe it wouldn't be fitting to be here. I know we all have stories and things about how far the Lord has brought us. Not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify God for everything. We preach not of ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Christ's sake. For God, who has commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, has shined in our hearts. Has the Lord shined in your hearts this morning? Mm -hmm. Amen. That was kind of weak, but I'll take another ray, Amen. That's a little better. <laughs> has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, the face of Jesus Christ. And the next verse, verse 7, is where we begin our message this morning. You see, Paul was setting this up under inspiration of the Holy Spirit to give these individuals their Corinth a pep talk. For we have this treasure. What treasure? For we have, present tense, in A.D. 70, for we have this treasure. But we have, present tense, today, 2021, we have this treasure. What treasure? Well, I got my stock portfolio, you know, and all the, that's pretty good, you know. Is that the treasure that we cherish? No. No. You know, it's not, not how much we make. You know, and I've told folks, you know, I'm independently wealthy. My father owns it all. They look at you sort of funny. What are you talking about? I said, God owns it all. And I'm in line for an, an, an inheritance that's out of this world. Just that simple, you can make that proclamation and let folks know where you stand. Is our, is our treasure in heaven? Yes. We're looking forward to that eternal bliss for, for time and eternity. But what is this treasure? What, Paul, what are you talking about? But we have this, present tense, we have this treasure now. What is it? It's in an earthen vessel. An earthen vessel. Now what, you know, what in the round world is that? What are you talking about? You know, if you go clear back into the Garden of Eden when God made man, what did he do? He brought some dirt together and formed man and then breathed into his nostrils. If your loved one is here this morning, ladies, you can look at your husband and say, you're dirt. <laughs> but then does not go too far because, you know, a little bit later on in, in Genesis says that God made woman out of man. So, but, uh, with that, the treasure in earthen vessels is the light, the light of the gospel. We have it inside of us, inside these weak clay pots, molded, shaped. We sing a song, mold me, shape me, form me. But it also says, you know, in our hearts, we have that treasure. And do we keep our treasures to ourselves, especially the light of the gospel? No, we cannot. It takes us right back to Judges chapter 7. Well, if you remember in the Old Testament, Gideon and his, his folks were being about due to be overrun by the Midianites. And, go, and Gideon had 32,000 men to go and do battle against the, the individuals who were as many as the grasshoppers on the side of the hills, Scripture tells us. Vastly outnumbered. God sort of pared that down a little bit. From 33,000, 22,000 of them Gideon sent home because they were fearful. Then they came to a stream and God told them to just told Gideon to tell the soldiers to get a drink. And he said, those that lapped up like a dog, you know, you don't want them. 
So out of that, ten, there was 10,000 more that went, left Gideon with 300 guys and himself. And the reason it was pared down so much is because if they went there in vast numbers, they might give themselves to the glory. But if you remember that story from the flannel board in Sunday school, state-of-the-art technology, flannel board with the little cut cutouts, God told Gideon to put in the hand of each of those 300 men and Gideon himself, a horn in one hand, and a lamp in the other that was covered up with what? An earthen vessel. God told him to surround the camp. 300 men versus an innumerable amount. God told him, break that light. Break that vessel. And let the light shine and blow the horn. And it vastly confused that entire army that they killed themselves because they were so confused. You see, sometimes we might, our earthen vessel, we have to be broken. We have to come before a righteous and holy God because of the light that's there. And we need to shine that light. We have that treasure that's in our, in our earthen vessel in us. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Anything that we do, anything that we do is done by the power of Almighty God. The word power there is the same word that's used in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where it says, Jesus said to his disciples, you shall receive power. Not many days from now, the word is dunamis. It's from which we get our word dynamite. That's power. That's Holy Spirit power. That's Holy Ghost power. It's the power of the living Lord living inside of us that says we can't keep it in touch. And we can't keep it bottled up. Church, that's where there in Corinth, you can't keep it bottled up. Even though, even though you're facing some odd things, we are trouble on every side. Yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. We are cast down, but not destroyed. That word not comes up quite a bit during those couple of verses, don't it? And it applies to us today. You know, we're trouble on every side. You look around. You know, and, and you can wonder just how crazy can things get? We're troubled on every side. And if we let those types of things consume us, then we're going we're gonna to change our direction as, as far as the way we think that, that uh, you know, well, where's God in all this? He's abandoned us, you know. Jesus on the cross said, Father, why have you forsaken me? That relationship between God the Father and Jesus was broken for that short time period when Jesus died for all the sins of the world. And God couldn't look upon his son. That relationship, that fellowship was broken. Why have you forsaken me? We can be persecuted. Sometimes we feel like we're being persecuted, but not like those who live in other countries where if you have a copy of the Word of God, it means instant death. Again, we have missionaries that are there struggling to stay alive and also to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. When things are falling apart the whole way around us, we should not be in despair. The word not, we're troubled on every side, but yet not distressed. We are confident in our victory that we have in Jesus Christ. That the shed blood of Jesus Christ was more than sufficient to cover any distressed problem or personal dilemma that comes along. You know, we might get kicked down a time or two. 
that we serve a God that will pick us up, dust us off, and send us on down the road. Amen. Praise God for his grace and his mercy. You know, we don't have any control over what's happening around us, but we have absolute control over what's happening within us. And I'm not speaking of medically or physically, you know, with the onset of age and things like that. We don't have any control of that. You know, like losing your hair and other items that seem to dissipate. We don't have any control of that. But spiritually, oh, we've got all that control within us. We cannot allow those things to affect us. You know, we cannot allow the world to drag us down into the mud pits of its drama. For those of you who are on Facebook, you know, I'm not. You know, just don't care for that kind of stuff. But I hear it a lot because someone else I know about <laughs> is into that or on that. All this drama. Drama, drama, drama. They, and, and some of it, you know, it just seems like they enjoy dragging you into it. Don't do that. As it comes to things that are happening. You know, we might be cast down, we might be persecuted, but we're not, you know, we're not forgotten. Besides that, the individuals, you know, we can't do anything for them. We can share the gospel with them. We can pray with them. We can, you know, invite them to, you know, to go there and, and, and talk with them about the answer to which they seek, but yet they have rejected because Satan has blinded them, as we read earlier. And we can become disappointed. Let's not lose sight of our eternal if it gets clouded by the mud of this world that we live in, the mud of this present day, you know why? You know why, Church of Corinth? You know why, Church of Montana? Paul now gives them the answer. You know, he's laid it out. He's telling them all the things that are, he's encouraging them to stay strong, be courageous, be lifted up, stand on that higher ground. When the, when the waters are raising up, go to the higher ground. Go to the ark. Always bearing about in the body of the dying Lord Jesus that has made the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Wow. When all proverbial hell is falling down on you, we should be the reflection, the image of Jesus Christ. We may not like it, but we should reflect what is in our hearts. The reflection, Paul is telling them, you have the reflection of life of Christ and the knowledge that when this earthen vessel has run its race, has fulfilled its course, has come to the end where we're going to cross over Jordan, Jesus is there with us. The Apostle Paul and some of the others throughout Scripture they faced adverse conditions, but yet they never bent, buckled, or bowed to what was facing them. You remember Daniel? Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. He was going to become a snack for all those critters. And his buddies, the three Hebrew children, they said, well, they threw him in the furnace. They said, well, if God doesn't save us, but at least king, we're not bowing to you. What about the Apostle Paul himself? You know, he's been beaten five times, shipwrecked three times, left for dead. He was stoned, you know. Kept on going, thrown into prison. Or how about the, the, the two prophets, the two witnesses that are yet to come in the book of Revelation? They'll stand and they'll declare the truth amongst all the heathens that are in Jerusalem at that time, and the Antichrist being one of them. 
anybody that attacks them for a time period, you know, Jesus strikes them down. But yet, the Antichrist will eventually they'll succumb to, to his power. They'll be dead for three and a half days, lying in the streets of Jerusalem. Scripture bears it out. The people from all over the world will start giving gifts. It's a satanic Christmas, if you will. Giving gifts to one another because ah, these two guys are dead. <laughs> but three and a half days, they spring back up. Praise God. You cannot overcome the power of God. And we cannot become overcome by the power of the world if our heart is in Jesus Christ. We are a reflection of what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. And it wouldn't be a normal sermon if I didn't reference the book of Romans. Romans. Such a good book. It's the how-to of Christian life. You know, knowing there in Romans chapter 5, or excuse me, Romans chapter 6, verse 5, it says, Having been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. You can burn my house, steal my car, but you can't take Jesus out of my heart. That's right. You can take my life. Fear those that can, fear not those that can take your life, but fear him who can take your spirit. When all else fails, Jesus, when our lifetime on this earth is done, we know that we will live again. We live in that planet in the likeness of his death with the the blessed hope that we know that we'll rise again and be with the Lord. So we can walk around saying, hey, I'm too blessed to be stressed. I'm too anointed to be disappointed when things come along. For we that live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also, Jesus Christ, but might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. The church, we should be reflecting Jesus, whether it's in Corinth or whether it's here. We know we have victory. And by exercising our faith, exercising, ooh, boy, <laughs> that's the word no one likes to hear. You know, especially, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, usually for New Year's Day, what's one of the, the things that we're going to do? We're going to get fit and healthy, and, and <coughs> it goes for about two weeks or sometimes two days, or three months if you're lucky. When that newness wears off, we go back to our old ways. But that should not be the case when we're exercising our faith, knowing that Jesus Christ is Lord and He is the commander of our lives. The Apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 11. Paul lists a bunch of things that, you know, those who shall not inherit the earth but it's one of the things that, that we look at. I was made a mark here so I can find it. Gives us a lot of hope. Now here again, he's speaking to the, the church of Corinth and to the community of Corinth. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of earth? This kingdom, excuse me, the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Fornicators, nor adulteries, nor adulterers, or, nor infeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extorters shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty nasty list. And you gotta just love Paul. He don't leave anybody out. 
You know, and just even those who were jealous. We talked about that this morning. Or, you know, where Miriam got uh, sent out of the camp for, two, for a week because she was jealous. That green-eyed monster raised its head. But amongst all that list, the Apostle Paul writes this. And such were some of you. He was talking to the church. Church members. <gasps> you mean the church members were like this? Mm -hmm. At one time, yes. And such were some of you. But then here's the blessed hope. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. You see, there's always hope for an individual. You know, salvation has an expiration date. It expires when you do. But until that time, because there's nothing in the afterlife that will grant you into the realm of glory. Jesus said, come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The trials, the troubles, the, tra the stuff that's happening, yeah, it may cause us a little perplexity. But come to Jesus. Open that communication line and pour your heart out and he'll give you the rest. That which is needed so that you can go through maybe just 10 minutes more or one second more or another day with the Lord. That's the only way, folks. So this is, this is Paul's pep talk. Go out and win one for the giver. <laughs> no. Go out and do the Lord's work. And win one for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. All right. Stand as we sing our last hymn. <laughs> Grab a hold of that nail scarred hand. Whenever the trials of life come along, he's there to walk you through it. That reminded me of the one children's song that we used to do, Win Them One by One. Mm -hmm. Precious Lord.
knowledge to know that during those times when we're weak, when we're tired, when we're worn, precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, and help me stand as we face the days ahead. Sometimes there'll be trouble. Sometimes there'll be distress. The precious Lord is there to take your hand and walk you through each and every step. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning, to know and relish in the fact that you're here, your presence is real, and you, we love you, and we serve, want to serve you to the utmost. Be with each and every member that is here this morning. Keep us all safe until we gather together next Lord's Day or until we meet you in the air. Lord, watch over and protect us. Strengthen us and empower us. Embolden us to share the light of the love of Jesus. In his name, the name that is above all names, Jesus our Lord.